Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to tonight's webinar with Edmund Terracoprian, Reportage and Street Photography. I'm Boris Bergman from Datacolor, and I would like to welcome you to this webinar. First, allow me to give you a short overview about the next upcoming 60 minutes. Um, after this short introduction, I will hand you over to Edmund. Edmund, great to have you here tonight. And Always welcome. a pleasure. Great to be here. Thank you. And um, after that presentation we will see from Edmund, we will go into a chat and you will have the possibility to enter all the questions you have regarding the presentation and also regarding our products. Okay, that's it now from my side. And uh, Edmund, I will promote you to be moderator. So please share your screen with us. Thank you. Right. Works. Uh, ah, it's the wrong screen, I guess. Is that the wrong screen? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, now it's the right one. <laughs> now it's the right one, great. Right. <laughs> Life. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for uh, joining in. Great to have you. Uh, here and uh, we'll be spending some time in this virtual classroom. Uh, so, as you know, my name is Edmund Terracopian. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, reportage or photojournalism and also street photography, plus touching a little bit on my workflow, um, sort of digital photography and digital processing and so on. Um, so, a quick piece of background I've been a press photographer, a photojournalist since 1989. Um, I've been very fortunate, and uh, during my career, I've, I've witnessed some, some amazing things, and I've picked up a few, few important awards along the way. Um, I'm fortunate enough to be a British Press Awards Photographer of the Year, and very fortunate to have a World Press Photo Award for my news work. Um, alongside my photojournalism, I also do a fair amount of commercial photography, commercial and PR photography, and in the last five or six years, uh, some filmmaking as well, but uh, that's that's for another day. So, what makes a photograph good? Um, it's often a question that's asked, and for me, it's one that brings forward some sort of emotional response, one that captures a moment, one that captures an emotion, um, and makes the viewer have a response that's emotional and, and also psychological, so creates a thought. A picture that makes the viewer think and feel something. A picture that informs and brings an understanding for the viewer of whatever the photograph might be of. Uh, it might be an event, it might just be a special moment. For me, when these, when these uh, elements are combined, that's what makes a photograph very special. As far as my photojournalistic work, um, I think it's important to sort of approach this type of work uh, with certain responsibilities. Um, in my opinion, humanity is the foundation of any image. Then comes the journalism aspect, and then finally the photography. Uh, you know, we need to always remember that it's not our story, it belongs to the subject, and we need to be sensitive to this. Um, so being humane, being ethical, um, having some sympathy and empathy, these are all very, very important values. And then the journalism comes in, basically meaning that we make sure that whatever we're about to report with our camera is correct. Um, you know, it's, uh, we've verified it, we've made sure that uh, everything we're sort of about to present in a photograph is, is correct and it's not, is not misleading. Um, and finally, it's the photography where the aesthetic and the skill of a, of a photographer, you know, the photographer's eye, the photographer's soul come in and, you know, you create a photograph that is powerful enough to be able to convey the message. Um, I did an interview for Apple's professional website a couple of years ago and uh, this quote I've taken from that interview, it, it, it kind of goes on to explain um, basically my, my thoughts on, on photojournalism. I'll just read it out. You're there with a purpose to tell the story, to share with the world what's happening. The camera is never, however, a shield. 
if you look at any scene, the eye goes straight to the worst aspect, the most intense part. You home in on it, both emotionally and compositionally. You must feel the human relationship in any situation to cover it well. That's what allows you to connect with people and get up close. Moving uh, straight on, um, this uh, the first couple of stories I'm gonna I'm gonna show photo essays. I'm gonna show a very uh, very sort of strong, typical reportage stroke photojournalistic works. Um, this is a story I shot a while ago now in uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, which is uh, an enclave of Armenia which is at war with Azerbaijan. Uh, and to this day, a ceasefire exists going back to uh, 94. So to cover any kind of story, one has to unravel all the angles and all, all the different aspects and facets to the story. So um, as you can see from, uh, from the beginning sort of slides, it's daily life, it's people, it's places, a church being rebuilt. And inside the church, I, I stumbled on, on the most astonishing, uh, astonishing find. This soldier had climbed up into the dome to pray, and uh, I sort of climbed up there, and he allowed me to take his picture, and later said he climbs up there because he feels he's closer to God. And of course, with any war, it's the children that suffer, the joy of childhood being stripped away. As a coach driver. It's a lady that works at uh, one of the one of the army barracks as a cook. And uh, Nagorno Karabakh is a very very strong Christian country. So everywhere one looks, there's sort of elements of of, of Christianity and faith. The uh, the magazine on the on the AK-47 being carved out particular soldier with his bandana and this is the secondary front line so soldiers are a little bit more at ease at this stage this is lunchtime this was the only time they'd had meat in uh, in, in several weeks Soldiers walking toward the front. And the harsh realities of war, this bizarre juxtaposition that, that was on the edge of this minefield. And of course, uh, people pay high prices when we sadly go to war with each other. Um, these soldiers are paralyzed from the waist down. And uh, this is a hospital where they've come to for their uh, continued treatment. This particular soldier was uh, was in a tank uh, that blew up. He's got very serious head injuries. I was told that he, he died several days after this picture was taken. And in amongst all the horror, one finds these astonishing moments. This soldier's writing a letter back to his mother back home, sort of very touching touching moment where if you sort of explore further you go from the guy to his gun to his helmet and you realize that uh, this isn't sort of a YMCA or some sort of uh, youth hostel but in fact a, a, a soldier's uh, army barracks and the heaviest cost of war of course is life it's a very young soldier who was killed whose family sort of come to pay respects at his graveside. Moving on, uh, I did a story on the 10th anniversary of the Armenian earthquake, which devastated basically the whole country, but flattened the north of the country. It um, knocked out the two main factories up north, which employ 70% of the region. Uh, so overnight, there was this mass unemployment. Uh, 
and mass, obviously, loss of life, sadly. Over 10,000 were killed. Uh, many hundreds of thousands were injured and made homeless. And when one looks at these pictures, it, it, you know, it could have happened that morning. But uh, sadly, this is sort of 10 years on of a region still trying to get back on its feet and, and move forward. This lady lost both her legs. This chap sadly lost his entire family. He is the only one who survived from the from the whole family. And in, in the back, in the background, you can see photographs hung on the wall of his his the shed. Basically, he lives in a shed now, making bread. These chaps are recycling uh, metal. They're trying to get metal out of the concrete foundation so they can go and uh, sell, the, sell the, the, the rods for scrap metal and uh, be able to put food on the table. This is all the rubble uh, from the earthquake that was taken out and, and uh, thrown about outside of the main towns. But as with anything, there's always uh, there's always another side to that coin. In in all this sort of misery and hardship, once in a while, one finds the sort of joyous moments of life. And uh, stumbled on this couple getting married, um, who'd actually just got married. It was a really lovely moment. This chap was so ill, but the situation was so bad that. They had to, he had liver disease, and uh, he needed strong medication for, for his liver. As you can see, he's also only got one eye. He is a very, very unfortunate guy. Um, but the, econo the, the economy being what it was, uh, they had to alternate between food and medicine. So one week they would buy food, and then the next week they would buy medicine. And that's his brother, who makes uh, quite a perilous journey every day to come and see him and make sure he's okay. And they're also living in a in basically a porter cabin made of thick cardboard walls, um, in a place where the temperature falls to minus twenty three, minus twenty five degrees centigrade at night, and snows heavily too. This is a, a marketplace, kindergarten. It's so nice to see a smile, but most of the children are so serious, um, sort of childhood, been stolen from them because of the harsh conditions. But again, another heartwarming smile on the road to a village. Oh, beg your pardon, moved off that too quickly. Um, the cemeteries are, are, are really very, very sad, as, as all our cemeteries. But with Armenian uh, tombstones, this amazing, very photorealistic carvings um, are found on, on the headstones. So it's almost like looking at a, a, a photographic album of, of who's, uh, who's buried there. And um, as a result of the earthquake, the, the numbers in the cemeteries just multiplied and multiplied and multiplied. His mother and four children all wiped out. The people in uh, in this town, which is called Gumri, and it used to be called Leninagan, um, were hit were hit sort of very very bad. Only second after the town of Spidak, and this uh, superstition started to go around the town that God had punished them because they didn't have a church when. The area was part of the Soviet Union. Lenin destroyed the churches there and uh, then allowed them to build another one. So just after the earthquake, when the aid started to appear, they got all this aluminium sheeting and, uh, and created this, this quite amazing looking church uh, at the top of this hill where the cemetery is. This is the actual day of the 10th anniversary where people flocked churches to pray for the souls of, of their lost ones.
this is on the road to th this uh, quite amazing monument on top of another hillside where hundreds queued to go. For a service. It's one of the bishops there. There's a president, the then president of Armenia. It's quite sad, you know, come seeing these families in such dire straits that even ten years on they still don't have the money for a headstone. And uh, you know, this this lady's I'm guessing that must be a husband, it could be a brother, um, is uh, still doesn't have a headstone. And these are the unknowns, people who haven't been identified in unmarked graves. As we're coming up to the ninth anniversaries, I mean, it's, it's amazing how quickly time flies. Um, I thought I'd share my, my images from the day of the London bombings. Uh, a lot of these pictures were published and are published internationally, very far and wide. Uh, that I knew of, uh, that I had 240 front page, front pages the next day, um, spread across the world. Um, the edit that I'm going to show you now, I'm going to share with you now, uh, has some of the better known images, but beg your pardon, has some of the better known images, but there's also uh, newer material that actually hasn't been uh, hasn't been shown. These are all taken at Edgware Road, and the first wave of people to come out of the tube station were were fine. They were, they were in the carriages which weren't hit. They were, they were clearly visibly shaken, but they were fine. And then there was this lull of perhaps only three or four minutes. And this lady called Davina came out being helped by this very, very friendly passerby, a chap called Paul Dadge, who was an ex-fireman. And it's only after seeing her that the true horror of what had happened became apparent. Being underground, obviously, we had no way of judging how serious it was. You know, the authorities were still saying it was an electricity power surge, although we kind of knew that this must be a terrorist attack because there had been three tube stations that had been uh, three trains, three tube trains or tube stations that had been attacked. The eyes really do say it all, don't they? Truly horrendous day. In every shop that had televisions, there was crowds of people st standing outside trying to find out what was going on. And then the Evening Standard came out, and people started flocking to the newsstand to read about what, uh, what had happened. And the last image I took on that day was the flag at half-mast on Buckingham Palace. Okay, I think uh, that's uh, I've probably depressed everyone a, a lot, so uh, apologies for that. But unfortunately, such is life. Some parts of, uh, of our existence is, is pretty serious and uh, can be quite sad. So I'm going to show something completely opposite to that, something a little bit more upbeat, but actually a lot more upbeat. Um, quite silly, quite fun. Um, I, earlier this year I was in Los Angeles. Uh, I primarily went for, for an award ceremony. I had one of my films uh, was in the finals of the Taste Awards. Um, but I also used that time there uh, to shoot a story. I call it LA Diary. Um, so it's, it's, it's basically Los Angeles seen through my camera for, uh, for five or six days.
the light in Los Angeles is just amazing. It's so nice. It's so easy to uh, to work there. Rodeo Drive, Beverly Hills. Supremely expensive designer street. So I've tried to capture various aspects, various angles of life. You know, this is obviously the sort of highbrow, fashion conscious, uh, massively polished kind of people. And uh, tourists, I think they were Russian, flocking to see the Hollywood sign. Uh, in case anyone's, anyone can't work it out, they're pretending they're holding up the sign uh, for the lady taking a picture on an iPad. And on to Santa Monica Pier and Venice Beach. Lots of fit, muscular people. And LA Diary is actually a multimedia piece. It's, uh, it's kind of a, a short film with audio interviews and music and photography and video all sort of mixed, uh, mixed into one project. And I had three protagonists in the, in the project. And this is the first protagonist. This is Andrea Fechko, um, who's a TV host uh, you know, Los Angeles and Hollywood, the sort of uh, star and TVs and films and fame and, uh, and all that. So I decided that one of my characters was going to be someone from that world. And uh, Andrea fitted that perfectly. So we spent half a day on... Uh, on the beach, which is obviously very LA, and at sunset, some uh, quick fun at Santa Monica Pier, which is again a big LA kind of scene, and uh, these are some uh, some more portraits of Andrea at uh, the Thompson Beverly Hills Hotel. Very nice, chic place. And another another side to the sort of LA lifestyle is uh, is obviously the fast food, the hamburgers, and the, and whatnot. So that's something else that I had an eye on. It's a place called Fat Burger, uh, which was actually I have to say extremely tasty. But uh, the sort of decor is very, very sort of old American diner type. Uh, so it worked quite well. A custom bike scene. There's a chap, there's a mechanic working on, uh, on a custom bike for a customer. And uh, my second protagonist, my, my second uh, character in the film is none other than the world famous author of this world famous image um, called Napalm Girl taken in Vietnam. Um, the nickel mat on the left and the Leica M3 on the right are actually cameras that he used in Vietnam. Um, the Leica in the middle is a more modern uh, M9P uh, that he still uses and uh, it's photographer Nick Ut from Associated Press uh, he's one of AP's photographers, and he's, he's still an active working photographer, working away in Los Angeles, covering all sorts of news stories, fires, politics, uh, Air Force One, the president, um, some, uh, some celebrity red carpet stories and, uh, and whatnot as well. And it was a real, real pleasure and, a, and an honor to meet such, uh, such an amazing photographer who, at the age of 18, took that astonishing photograph. Um, and many would consider that picture the image that ended the Vietnam War. Um, again, if you check out the multimedia piece, you'll see and hear the interview with Nick. It's, uh, it's fascinating. Um, and uh, lower down the road, I, uh, I will be doing a, a, a full uh, video especially just on Nick, um, so that editors are still to be done. This is outside the Chinese theatre. Hollywood Boulevard with all the uh, stars and stuff. So already you can see in this in this kind of reportage a lot of it's kind of street photography. It's uh, it's looking and seeing moments and taking pictures of it. 
um, they're actually pretty closely intertwined. The Spider-Man character jumping off uh, some newspaper bins. This is downtown LA in uh, what's called the Fashion District. Um, I think it really needs to be renamed the Unfashionable District. It really is a little bit over the top, but uh, it is what it is, and it's a fascinating area to photograph. And my third protagonist, my third character from the LA Diary multimedia piece is a street artist. Uh, many have coined him the Banksy of LA, and uh, the, the street artist, is, is, is his name is Plastic Jesus, who creates these amazing stencils. And one of the messages that I really, really liked uh, was the stop making stupid people famous. I think it's uh, it's such a great slogan. Um, it actually has a has a lot of depth to it as well. Um, so again, there's uh, in the multimedia piece, which you can find online on my Vimeo uh, website. Um, so just search for Terracopian Vimeo, and you'll find it. Uh, you know, there's an interview with with Plastic Jesus. Um, his thoughts behind his works and um, a lot more about his other projects. Very, very interesting. Sticking with downtown, we've got the uh, the Disney Concert Hall, which is absolutely astonishing building. That's uh, it's there on the right hand side. Here's a close up of it. Back to the fast food joints. Uh, this is actually. Uh, a weekly gathering spot for people into hot rods, so highly customized uh, American uh, cars, generally old American cars. It's a very, very much a big slice of Americana. Gorgeous, fabulous Cadillac, absolutely stunning. So that's the last slide from uh, LA Diary. Uh, if you guys want to make a note of this, this is the uh, the direct link to the LA Diary multimedia piece on uh, on Vimeo. So if you go to vimeo.com uh, and then just uh, look for the number eight seven eight one seven two seven three. So vimeo.com slash eight seven eight one seven two seven three uh, you'll be able to see the whole video I was going to play it um, on this webinar but sometimes there's issues with frames dropping and the sound dropping so um, I think it'd be much better if, uh, if people are interested sort of go and have a look at it uh, yourselves and by all means get get in touch and if you have any questions or comments you know love to hear from you guys so going back to again how how I think about uh, things, my, my approach to taking a picture, be it a single image, be it a, be it a photo essay. Um, you know, one, one gets onto the scene, whatever that scene might be, and it's a question of dissecting it into individual parts um, and looking at which of these slices actually illustrate the story, which of them represent the story, and uh, photographing them. Um, which is the obviously the very last thing. The camera is always the last. It's it's the mind comes first. Um, camera is the last thing that uh, is, is part of the equation. The journey to the picture. So what steps do we take uh, to taking a photograph? You know, there's a learning of the craft of photography. You know, at first comes all the technical stuff. This is a shutter speed. This is the aperture. This is what focusing does. Uh, white balance and, and raw and JPEG and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, that's that's a journey that can take uh, an entire lifetime, in fact. You know, photography is always evolving, and we're always learning. It's uh, you, If you speak to the, uh, to the most experienced uh, photographer, they will tell you they are still learning, that, you know, every day still brings its, its, uh, its new challenges and... Uh, and new sort of snippets of information uh, going 
garnered and learned. Um, so, yeah, going back to the list, so learning the craft of photography, you know, this could be weeks into the weeks into becoming a photographer as an enthusiast. Um, it could be months, it could be years, it could be decades, you know. Um, it applies to, to everybody, uh, you know, amateur photographer or high end enthusiast or professional photographer. Um, journey to the picture. The second point is spending the money on uh, what is very expensive camera equipment. You know, this stuff doesn't come cheap. We work hard, uh, we save up, we spend money, we buy this kit. Thirdly, physically getting on location, and this could be this could be a foreign assignment. It could be a foreign trip. Um, it might just be down the road, but you know we have made an effort to get from wherever we are to wherever this photograph is. And then it's spending time finding the picture and shooting it. Um, at extremes, you know, this could be somewhere where one's risking one's life. You know, it could be a war zone. It could be extreme weather, it could be an earthquake region. Um, so basically, you know, there is an effort involved and sometimes that effort is, is, uh, is dangerous. So what next? So after all the effort, expense, then editing these images, processing them and sharing them, we have the hope that they are correctly processed. I say hope because I know a lot of my colleagues uh, use screens which aren't in any way set up properly. To guarantee that they are accurate, that, that they are color accurate, we need to do one very simple thing. Really simple using equipment which is probably the cheapest item in, in the whole uh, list of kit that we buy. Certainly cheaper than the, than the cheapest lens I have. Cheaper than my flash guns in fact. And that's color calibration equipment. To make all this effort, it would be such a shame to then spend all the effort in processing, but doing this on a screen which actually may not be correctly set up at all. You know, the red might not be the correct red, the blue might not be the correct blue. And then obviously to the importance of getting skin tones right. So I just want to show a little bit about some of the kit that I use for this. Um, I think if uh, James Bond was a photographer, this is the case Q would make for him. It's uh, it's a very uh, very cool little package from uh, from uh, our friends at Data Color, and it's called the Spider Capture Pro Case, uh, which is filled with goodies that that the majority of digital photographers will will need. Um, so it's uh, it comes with the Spider Four Elite col Colorometer which is used to calibrate the screen. The spider lens cal, uh, which is used for focusing, focus checking on your camera, which I'll talk about later. Uh, and the spider cube and spider checker, which I'm not gonna be talking about in this webinar, but uh, it'll be something to, to talk about in the future. Just giving you a look inside. So the lens cal is in the lid. The color checker is what you can see in the, in the cube. You can see the spider cube you can see on the right hand side. And this is the, the actual colorometer, spider full color, uh, elite colorometer, which is what's used to, to calibrate the screen. I've got some uh, shots of, uh, of it in action. It's a, it's a small kind of thing. You know, if you've never seen one, um, it's kind of the size of an old fashioned mouse with, with sort of legs on it. Um, this picture shows uh, me calibrating my MacBook Pro. So you basically hang it on the screen, you start up the software, uh, sorry, you start up the software, you hang it on the screen and you follow the instructions. It's really straightforward. I know a lot of people panic thinking that it's, uh, it's an extremely complicated thing to do, but it is so, so straightforward. Um, comes with a very neat little stand as well. Um, so that's it in front of a 15 inch MacBook Pro. And this is it on my 11 inch MacBook Air, uh, which, uh, which I use for trips where I need to travel very light. Um, this is the software. You basically start the software. It shows you where to hang it. And uh, you make a couple of choices and you click go and it just starts to calibrate your screen and at the end of it uh, 
your screen is set up correctly, you know the colors that you're looking at are correct, you know that the brightness level is correct, and even if you only work in, in black and white, having the correct luminosity set so you can get the full range and see it accurately uh, for sharing on the web, for making prints from is absolutely essential. Um, very, very straightforward. The other thing um, I wanted to quickly show you guys uh, was the spider lens cow. Um, so this basically it's something to test the focusing of your camera and your lenses. Um, you know, we all make mistakes, we all take pictures that are sometimes a little bit out of focus or a bit soft and we always blame our cameras because it's never us. Well, I figured out it's best to make sure that it actually isn't me. Um, and if it is me, I need to practice and if it's the cameras then I need to get those sorted out. Um, so this is the perfect uh, perfect tool for, for checking focus and also for helping adjust micro focus on the majority of medium to high end DSLRs. You, know, you, you will have micro focused adjustments uh, which you can do yourself. So you basically put it up on uh, either on a tripod or on a, on a table that you know is, is definitely square, uh, is definitely parallel to the floor. You put your camera on another tripod and it's good to take time to make sure you, you, you have these level at the same level and you photograph it. Um, what you can see is, uh, is a sm you've got the big sort of square with the diagonal blacks and whites and uh, in the middle you've got the smaller square so you basically focus on that where the zero is on the ruler you focus on the little square to its left um, with your with all your lenses uh, so if you have two cameras, you would you would use both cameras and, and all lenses. And then as you go along, you just have a look at the picture on the back of your screen. Uh, you enlarge the picture, magnify it to 100% and have a look and see how close to that zero your focus point is, uh, your fo the, 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 um, uh, the sharp focus is. So as you can see in this picture, it's bang on the zero, which means that this lens on that camera is absolutely fine. Uh, this is with a 45 f1.8 on an Olympus OMD EM1, and it focused absolutely correctly, which is great. But if you've got a lens that's back focusing, front focusing, um, I've sort of shot an extreme example just to show. So this would be front focusing. So as you can see, the zero is completely blurred, and uh, and I've really made made an exaggerated shot here. You can see that the six is in focus. So you know that the lens is front focusing. Um, so if you've got micro focus adjustments, you just start clicking those for that particular lens and the camera will remember it in its memory. And you keep taking pictures as you go until you hit that zero mark. And then you know that that lens will, will focus properly when you're out in the street uh, shooting pictures. Even if you're using a, a manual focus camera like a Leica rangefinder, which is uh, another camera system which I use, it's, it's great to make sure that your rangefinder and your lenses are calibrated properly. So I get all my Leica M rangefinders and my Leica lenses, take these pictures, make sure that everything hits zero. And if it doesn't, then I can take that picture with the camera and lens back to Leica and they can adjust it in the factory to make sure it's, uh, it's working at an optimum. And just to show the other end of the, uh, <laughs> the extreme uh, range here, you know, we focused on uh, focused on the six to show extreme back focusing. So you know, if it's front focused, you saw, and this is a picture of it back focused. Very very straightforward. Such a handy tool to have. Uh, you know, it's very easy to spend many thousands on cameras and many thousands on lenses, and then not get the optimum from it. And we're sort of left wondering if it's us or if it's the camera or what's going on. Um, this way, you know, you set it all up, put it on tripods, take a picture, then you know definitely if there's a problem. If there's a problem, you can adjust it with micro adjustments, then perfect. You've nailed it, and you know that uh, the next time you make an effort to go somewhere to take a picture, uh, that the camera and the lens are working perfectly in, uh, in conjunction with each other. And it's just down to you to, to make the photograph. Moving on to more pictures. Uh, so street photography is a big passion of mine. Um, 
I've I've loved looking at street photographs from various photographers as uh, as as my photographic education sort of grew. Uh, you know, images from Henri Cartier-Bresson, uh, from Ian Berry, from Robert Duano. Um, just absolutely amazing, looking at uh, looking at society and cultures at a given point in time. Uh, you know, making interesting images for today, but these then becoming historical pictures uh, for tomorrow. Uh, from a practical point of view, street photography is also great for keeping you sharp as a photographer. You know, you're walking around, you see something, you've got milliseconds sometimes to react and uh, and take the picture. You know, the, the technical aspects that come into it, the compositional and aesthetic aspects which come into it, everything married into one in a split second and click. And your heart beats and you hope that you've captured it properly. You know, these are the things that really draw me to, to street photography. So I'm just going to show you, share with you a couple of, uh, of a few favorite, uh, favorite images. This is a shot from uh, the South Bank in London. This is Jermaine Street. Someone on a, on a cigarette break reading through their iPhone. This is a shot from the Republic of Ireland. It's a guy in his gallery and a busker outside with people walking past. There's sort of various dimensions to it. Businessman. Uh, just off uh, the Strand. This is an extremely old wine bar in the in London with practically no light. Such an atmospheric place. This is uh, it's one of my favoured street pictures. Um, just got extremely extremely lucky saw the rain stopped under under a shelter which was uh, very very handy because it was very very heavy downpour and the sign on the advertising sign on the left as you can see is illuminated but it's actually a revolving sign so it was a slideshow of five or six different adverts and every time this came on because it was very bright it would pick up the sort of uh, all the particles of rain and it gave it this sort of nice side lighting uh, but every time it got to this slide, the, the the people walking in front weren't, you know, didn't match, didn't work particularly well. Then all of a sudden, this businessman walked into frame, and I took one. I may have taken a, sh a second shot, but it was just such a quick moment, and it just all came together. This sort of love your job, this grey, dreary London day in Hammersmith, pouring rain, businessman, briefcase in hand, no umbrella drenched you know does he love his jobs I don't know I'm guessing maybe not on that day and there's pictures everywhere I uh, I took a friend to the airport um, and we were just waiting in, in queue for her to check in and, um, and there's this wonderful Jewish family just waiting to check in as well with uh, with all their children sort of clambering up on the check-in desk it was such a beautiful picture just made a lovely lovely shot Somerset House uh, Christmas ice ice skating. I think as street photographers, uh, you know, we have some responsibility to make photographs which are interesting, are nice, say a story, aren't necessarily something that so you know would show someone off in a in a bad light, um, because that would be kind of unfair. You know, I think one needs to have a an, eth an ethical um, and moral sort of approach to street photography. So you know, if I saw someone falling over in the street, I wouldn't photograph them. Or if I if I did, I wouldn't share it because you know, it would cause embarrassment. Um, she was completely different though. When she fell, she was in such hysterics and having such a lovely time. And uh, her friend to the right of the image, looking back, smiling. It was just such a joyous moment. Um, that you know, given the atmosphere and the laughter and the, the, the lovely feel to it, um, you know, I'm more than happy to share this image. Uh, you know, it's not a negative picture. Just wonderful picture of 
this old married couple still together, still walking around hand in hand, helping each other. It's really touching. The joy of discovery, a talking, moving phone box. It's a magical moment, lovely expression. And the unfortunate juxtaposition. I I saw this, I'm not sure if it was artwork or advertising, there's basically uh, uh, training shoes inside this box where people can view, peek through the viewing slits and, uh, and have a look at them. And I just knew that something funny was going to happen because of the way one of the slits was, was uh, uh, placed on the on the artwork and I just waited and waited a bit and uh, you know in, uh, in not a very long time this this woman came over and bent over and it just uh, made made a funny image a funny juxtaposition light shapes depth movement people street picture The much photographed skate park in uh, in the South Bank. I always look at it when I walk past and sometimes take pictures. And this particular one works for me. <coughs> Pardon me. The, uh, the the light and the shadow and the gentleness of it. It's uh, it's something that one doesn't see normally. I think at uh, at the skate park. mirroring each other but not quite there's always a picture to be seen we're having dinner um, again at the South Bank I do like the South Bank and this is a way to sort of working outside for the for the outdoor seaters um, and he came up to the till to to ring up a bill and the light just fell perfectly on his face and sort of reflection and the pattern design in the window, it sort of all adds together. The elements, the depth, the couple in the back chatting away, the three in the front, the lady drinking a beer, the other one eating, the chap smiling. Color, shape, juxtaposition, all the, I find all of these things interesting. They all sort of work together. Trying to find the way. Bizarre street lighting from underneath benches. Very, very strange. It's a conversation. The chap in an art gallery. Mirroring in the underground. This lady was, was awesome. She's sadly homeless. Um, that's her home behind her. And uh, She's just these ducks sort of came up to her and there was this lovely moment where she was sort of playing around and enjoying the ducks and the heron there's a heron there on the right hand side too talking of ducks a couple having a picnic with the ducks coming out of the the thames quite a nice uh, quite a nice moment picture in uh, in a bar in Leipzig deep conversation it's a shot in Berlin by the memorial to the Holocaust and this sort of rain broke out and when heavy rain comes most people will put away their cameras but if you can find shelter and look look around there's often really really nice pictures to be made <coughs> cigarette break Waiting for the tram. It's a shot in Margate. 
and there's pictures to be seen it's uh you know one what one often doesn't look through and see what's behind the window but this kind of worked really well kick him back the sign says open but the rides are empty so Margate fun fair and another shot from Margate I've, I've just done recently done a, a project on it which I'm still sort of editing through so these are a few pictures I thought I'd share just love all the colours in this picture. The NAF advert, the NAF ice cream cone, and then the bracelets and the laces. It's uh, sort of quite fun. So, yeah, thank you for your patience. That's the, uh, the end of my presentation. But, you know, by all means, if you have any comments or questions, I'd love to hear them. And uh, do keep in touch. These are my details. Um, so do have a look at that multimedia piece, uh, LA Diary, if, uh, if you get a chance. Um, and you can see links to most of my websites from my main website, which is www.terracopian.com. Uh, I'm also on Twitter, at Terracopian. Uh, my film work, my video work is on uh, terravision.eu. Uh, if you haven't come across it before, I've got uh, quite a popular blog, which is called Photo This and That. .co.uk. And finally, you can find me on Instagram too. Uh, my name on Instagram is naturally Terracopia. Um, so, uh, yeah, if anyone's got any questions, uh, now is the time. Edmund, it was a pleasure. Great, thank you. And I have opened the question pot, so uh, please feel free to enter all the questions you have. And we also have a few questions from ourselves.